Let's go on to the standard of care, all right? Which is, which is a very nice segue here, I think. Somebody comes in with psoriasis, initial diagnosis. What is the standard of care right off the bat? I'd say you'd have to um, classify the psoriasis as either relatively limited or very extensive. If it's relatively limited, like it's just on the elbows and knees, then the standard of care would be some kind of topical therapy. You could do localized ultraviolet light treatments would be an alternative, but basically you're likely to start with a cream, see if that would work. If people have so much body coverage that creams are unlikely to work, or if they have psoriatic arthritis and the cream's not gonna fix that, then some kind of total body approach is in order. Um, for a long time, we thought phototherapy would be the, the, the way to go for these people. And if that's reasonable and feasible, that may be a perfectly good first line option. Uh, before biologics were introduced, methotrexate was the next thing to do for people. Um, but um, because the biologics are more effective and safer than methotrexate, I would say the biologics are first line. And because they're so much easier, I think a lot of patients might prefer just to take an injection yeah. once in a while than even do the light treatment. So uh, if I hear you correctly, we are, we're moving into the, the, the 21st century in which we have biologics, which we understand the, 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 the biologic mechanism of, da of damage here, if you will, and that we have drugs to treat it as opposed to just phototherapy, for example. Not that phototherapy doesn't work. Yeah, I think the thing is that it needs to be patient-centered. And so what, really what we're doing is explaining to the patient what their disease is about and what their treatment options are. And for those who have more extensive disease or more resistant to topical therapies, we talk about ultraviolet light approaches, right. oral medication approaches, injectable biologic approaches. One of the wonderful things I get to do on these panels is to ask questions of specialists <laughs> that I would love to ask. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna ask it now, because I've, I've wondered about this forever. A lot of ultraviolet light we know is carcinogenic. So what's the cancer, skin cancer rate of people getting a lot of light box therapy? Yeah, so this is a great question. You would think it would be substantially elevated, yeah. but for our more modern uses of ultraviolet light, something called narrow band phototherapy, a specific wavelength of light that's very effective for, for, for psoriasis. Uh, there's only been a few studies that look at this, and none of them have shown higher rates really? of skin cancer. It's pretty hard to, to do those studies definitively. You want to look at thousands and thousands of patients for many, many years. Okay. So what clinicians will often say, or what our experience tends to be, is that if there's higher rates of skin cancer from it, it's, it's modest enough that most patients don't seem to mind it. But it's certainly a concern. All yeah, right. I think that's very well said. There must be some increased risk. Sure. But studies from the Mayo Clinic where they gave people tar and light, the old kind of light, mm -hmm. and they followed people for decades, I don't think they saw any detectable yeah. increased mm -hmm. risk. And I think the reason for this is, you know, most of the skin cancers happen where the sun hits you on a regular basis. Right. Head, yeah, right. so your head gets so much light mm -hmm. over time. The psoriasis on the body, when we're treating it with light, um, those areas have not had a lot of light. So you could probably give those areas a lot of light before they'll ever start developing the skin a, cancers that you see on dose, the, is what you're saying. Okay. So, there are guidelines, right? The AAD guidelines, the, the AAD NPF guidelines uh, for the treatment of this. Have they been updated recently? Uh, what do they say at this point? The, the guidelines can't be up to date because yeah. <laughs> you, you, you put together this panel and you give them evidence and you spend some years doing this and then they come out with guidelines that are three years out of date mm -hmm. from the, the day they do it. And my impression of the guidelines that have been produced are guidelines of the things that are appropriate and then you let the dermatologist use their judgment. That's right. Because each patient is so individual in terms of their comorbidity uh, profile, their preferences, their willingness to try different therapies or what's available to them. That's really what dictates uh, decision making with a patient. Uh, you know, I'm part of the AAD MPF guidelines. Uh, they are just rolling out now starting in 2018, 2019 and so on. Uh, and there's just so much progress going on. I, I find it hopefully pretty useful for providers as well as for payers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of circumstances that aren't traditionally addressed, like what therapies might be useful on the palms and soles or uh, for example you know not every patient does well with standard doses of say ustekinumab and there's good level A data showing that you could increase the dose uh, of ustekinumab in patients and have uh, better outcomes with the same safety profile. Can, yeah, go ahead. can I just put out there the, the maybe an obvious question in terms of so, so there is believe it or not a little difference in the range of costs 
of some of these products. You think? <laughs> you think. I bet tar is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so as uh, somebody who may be in a utilization review capacity, uh, somebody, uh, a patient with significant psoriasis, mm -hmm. uh, comes in, says, hey, 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 you know, Doc, I saw on the TV this great new product for treatment of psoriasis. I can then go to the locker room and I'm fine. People are not going to see my, my skin being affected. I can, I can go to the swimming pool again. So, so I'm trying to get my arms around that because there, there are a number of products, some of which are subcutaneous, some of which are not oral. They don't have to sit in an infusion center for you know, one to two hours every other month. You know. so, so there are some significant improvements to your point yeah. with treatment options, but, but how do I then reconcile that with the, with the cost of those I products? I want to get to that.